We hadn't uh, mentioned this yet, but uh, a few weeks ago, uh, understanding the situation that uh, Scott was in, uh, we did send to help with those expenses for him to make the trip here unexpectedly. Uh, we sent a thousand dollars, so uh, I don't know, we just never announced that, but there it is. And uh, just wanted you to know that uh, sometimes, um, sometimes we ask everybody to contribute, but this was so immediate that we just went ahead and sent the amount of money. But anyway, we appreciate Scott and the work he's doing there, and I think he'll be here before too long. In Isaiah 6, we have God's calling of his prophet Isaiah. And a logical question to ask is, why isn't this in chapter 1? Well, verse 5 indicates that this is the initial call, as you just heard the purging that went on in that verse. Apparently, the design of the book of Isaiah to, was to begin with the heart of of the message. So there is the general introduction and condemnation of God's people in chapter 1. This is followed by a note of hope on the establishment of the church kingdom in chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. But then chapter 3 denounces the men and women of Judah. But in chapter 4, we find uh, a prophecy of the branch that is to come, who of course is Jesus. Finally, chapter 5 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago describes six woes that God was bringing upon the nation. Now, as we get to chapter 6, we have his calling that happened in the beginning which is quite unique, followed by an explanation of why things are the way they are in chapters 1, 3, and 5. These things took place, his, uh, his inauguration as a prophet took place the year King Uzziah died. The northern kingdom of Israel was less than 20 years away from being taken captive by Assyria. Judah would last about 150 years more before being taken captive by Babylon. There would be a couple of high points after the time of Isaiah. There would be the reigns of King Hezekiah and the reign of Josiah. But evil kings were on either side of them as seen in the very next chapter with Isaiah's encounter of Ahaz. But for now, we are watching Isaiah observe the Lord sitting on a throne and his train filling the temple. This seems to be a heavenly temple with a throne and an altar of incense. It might even be a vision, though that is not stated. The Lord seems to have a human form, which would indicate that it refers to Jesus, the member of the Godhead who takes on human form. In fact, John quotes Isaiah 6 and refers to the Lord there as Jesus. In John chapter uh, 12, verses 37 through 41. You might want to look that over. It, it takes a little time to, uh, for it to sink in. But John 12, verses 37 through 41. Jesus has earned the right to sit on the throne. He is both king and judge eventually. And when he is the judge... He is the perfect judge because he was the Son of Man, John chapter 5 and verse 27. However, that would be later on. He can still sit upon the throne at this time by virtue of who he is. 
Later on, it will be by virtue of what he has done, but right now it is by virtue of who he is. And uh, we get a clue concerning that in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. As that book opens, we find this description. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Jesus had creative power, and so he can be honored for that reason. But then it goes on, who being the brightness of the, his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So because of what he accomplished on earth, he is worthy of the throne, but he has also shown creative and sustaining power and is the very image of God. And so he can be worshiped and honored for that reason as well and be king. The train of his robe was regal, to say the least, it filled the temple. Now above it stood the seraphim. There were at least two of them, perhaps many more, the number of them is not stated. There may have been two rows of them, one on either side of the throne. They are described as having six wings. Also, though, a head, hands, and feet. Some have tried to link them with serpents based on uh, the similarity of word translated seraphim. But though there is a similarity, the snake beings of Egypt came centuries later. Truly, uh, their name is also associated with the word shine and the word noble. So there are some similarities with some other words in the Hebrew language. They are different from cherubim who only have four wings. And uh, they covered their faces. Why? Maybe an act of humility, being in the presence of God. Who knows? Why did they cover their feet? Well, we don't know that either. Some things are just not explained. But that is the description that we find of the seraphim. Verse 3 could be describing antiphonal singing, which is call and response. Uh, Perhaps some on this side called and some on the other side responded. It says one called to another saying, holy, holy, holy. And it is the message that is the important thing. This scene, by the way, is not unlike the one in Revelation chapter 4 where we find the four living creatures that also had six wings. However, Isaiah 6 is the only place where the word seraphim is used. When people think of the nature of God, what do we usually think of? His great love, his marvelous mercy, his uh, exceedingly wonderful grace. And God is. All of those things. But this is the only characteristic of God that is repeated three times. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Mankind will never understand God unless they first understand his character, his holy character. If we love sin... 
we are violating the very essence of God. Now, some have thought the word was uttered three times because of the concept of the Trinity, but it is more likely for intensity and emphasis that holy is said three times. The effect of the voice that was spoken was heaven shattering. The temple was filled with smoke, which is sometimes an accommodating a manifestation of God as in uh, the mountain smoking at Mount Sinai. What we want to notice next, however, is Isaiah's response. How would anybody respond to such a scene of glory and holiness? How does one react in such complete holiness and purity? Such glory is beyond our experience. One of the seraphim removed a coal from the altar of incense, put it in his hand, and flew to Isaiah where he touched his mouth with it. This purified his lips and made him fit to speak the truth. All his sins and iniquities were purged. It is interesting that in the Old Testament, if we think of destruction, the earth was destroyed by water. But in the New Testament, at the end of time, it will be destroyed by fire. The opposite is true with purification. Here Isaiah's lips are purified by fire but in the New Testament, we are all purified by water through baptism, in which the blood of Christ cleanses us of all our sins. Well, now let's go to the second part of Isaiah's calling. Verses 1 through 7 is what we have been discussing. Let's continue on with the rest of the uh, chapter. Verse uh, 8. And I, all, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. One question we might ask is why the plural, who will go for us? Well, there are three options that come to mind. Perhaps God was talking to the seraphim when he said, Who will go for us? But that is unlikely because God does not incorporate uh, angels or men into his plans usually. Another concept is, well, maybe it's just the editorial we, but God doesn't usually do that either. Perhaps it is because that it refers to all three of those who are part of the Godhead. We find in Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our own image. And again, that is probably a reference to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the God who is holy had a mission for someone. Having just been purified and seeing this wondrous and glorious sight, how could Isaiah answer otherwise than to volunteer. Well, I suppose he did not have to. But he appears to respond immediately. How blessed is that kind of volunteer spirit when God needs something done for Christians to say, here am I, send me. Well, what is the mission? He is being inaugurated as a prophet. What is the mission he is to go on? Verses 9 and 10. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. What was going to make the people have this response? 
the word of God. They have this response because of their hearts. And even though they hear the word, they do not want to hear it. They don't want to see it. They don't want to believe it. They don't want to do it. Undoubtedly, Isaiah was hoping for a better response. But even though they heard the message, they would refuse to understand it. Even though they saw various things, they would refuse to perceive. God was not speaking something to them that was complicated or unintelligible. They just didn't want to hear it. And what occurs in verse 10 is the result of his preaching. Their hearts become dull, their ears heavy, their eyes unable to see the truth. And notice how that in the second part of the, that verse, those three things are reversed. They won't return. They do not want to be healed. It's as uh, Zechariah describes it in chapter 7, verses uh, 11 and 12. Zechariah writes, But they refused to heed, shrugged their shoulders, and stopped their ears so that they could not hear. Yes, they made their hearts like flint, refusing to hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Thus great wrath came upon them from the Lord. God does not call them my people. Did you notice that? He calls them these people twice. And we can see why Isaiah begins with the condemnation of the nation in chapter 1. This is the chief thing that the book is about. Their love of sin, their refusal to hear the truth, their refusal to acknowledge it, their refusal to obey it. Well, let's read verses 11 through 13. <clears throat> then I said, Lord, how long? Well, that's a good question. I'm going to go preach to these people and they're not going to hear. How long is this going to go on? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming, for consuming, as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. One-tenth, that's not very many people from a nation, is it, to be able to return, especially considering that so many died of starvation and by the sword. So one-tenth is really a lot smaller maybe than what it sounds. But this is one of those good news, bad news, good news things. The bad news is only, uh, or a, the good news is a tenth will return, but the bad news is that even many of these will be consumed. However, the good news is that the holy seed still remains. A remnant survives captivity. A remnant of them will listen many hundreds of years later when John will prepare the way for Jesus and for salvation. Isaiah's efforts may seem as though they are in vain, but despite the overall rejection of his preaching, some good would eventually come from it. Most of his words fell on what Jesus would describe as stony 
ground. But even in this is a lesson for us. One that Jesus taught in the New Testament when he said that many would go into the road, the wide road towards destruction, and few would enter the gate that leads to eternal life. It has always been that way. It does it sound disheartening? Yes, to some degree, because the majority of people are always going to be lost, are not going to want to hear what God says. Few there be that find it, Jesus said. Preaching the word of God will not save anyone, although it should. And it is necessary, but it depends on the response of those hearing the message. Paul said that he was all things to all men, that he might by all means save some. He did not expect to save most people that he preached to. If Isaiah and Jesus and Paul could not save everyone, we're not going to either. We don't have any better tools or better presentation than they did. This is just the way that it is. But there will always be a remnant to reach out to. And thus Jesus gave the great commission to go into the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everybody needs to hear it. What they do with it, they're responsible for. We're responsible to volunteer to go out and present it to others. Thus, we follow in the steps of the apostles who fulfilled the Great Commission, and we do our best to reach all people that we can also. One of the apostles of Jesus preached on the day of Pentecost, and when people asked what they should do, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. And that's the same message. Various people have tried to change that message. But what Peter said still stands. It is still valid. And it will be until the Lord returns. If you have not repented of your sins and been baptized for them to be forgiven... Please give that serious thought. If you're ready to respond, let us know today. But if you've already done that, maybe you haven't been faithful and that needs to change. So if we can help you in any spiritual matter, let us know while we stand and while we sing.